In that case, let's move to the next one. It's Covadis action recognition. Covadis is Latin for where are you going? Where are you going action recognition? From that title, you think that that's a review paper and I don't usually go through review papers because that's gonna give us a superficial knowledge. But this is different because it's introducing a new method after going through an overview of other papers, it introduces a new method, okay? I know that last session, somebody asked me about LSTMs and can you use that? Yes, there are some papers that are using it. And the problem with RNNs and LSTMs is that they are sequential. You take your image, push it through your convolution, you get your LSTM. Up until this point, everything is uh, parallel, but then to go to the next step, you need to know the outcome of your LSTM. So that's where things are going to become sequential. And this is not parallelizable in time. And we know that for videos, we need them to be fast because these are much bigger data sets compared to a single image. Each one of your data is going to be multiple images. Okay. So that's your LSTM. The 3D ConfNet is what we just covered. You just put a 3D convolution over your stack of images to do your action recognition. We can do two stream. This one we covered right at the beginning of this session. So there's an image, there is a convolutional network, and there is the optical flows. Going through a parallel convolution and in the end they are gonna vote. You can do the same thing. You can combine this idea and the two stream idea and apply it for different frames in time. Once you do that, in the end, you're gonna get a bunch of features and on top of that, you can do 3D convolution. So the 3D convolution idea is coming from here, and the two stream idea is coming from the previous paper. And this is the new method that this paper is advocating. You have multiple images, you have the corresponding optical flows, you push them through 3D convolution rather than 2D convolution. You push the optical flow through a parallel 3D convolution, and then you combine, and then report your classific classification score. So what is K? K is the total number of frames, and N is the total number of neighboring frames that you're using for your optical flow. Because we know that these don't have to be the same. This would be one image, and then you can have N. This, is, this corresponds to L from the previous paper. This is the number of frames that you use for your optical flow. So what is this method called? It's going to be called I3D, inflated 3D. And what do we mean by inflated? You can treat a video or an image, a single image, as a video. How? You just replicate the same image over and over again. So that's going to be a very boring video. You're just looking at one image evolving over time. But that's going to be your video. And you can have a 2D convolution on that. This is equivalent to having 2D filters n times along the time dimension. And then you're just rescaling the weight by n. You're just dividing by n because you have n frames and they are the same frame. That's a boring frame and uh, that's a boring video. You start with the convolutional neural network, perhaps trained on ImageNet. These are going to give you your 2D filters. Now you need to copy it. You need to inflate it to three dimension. How do you do it? You just copy it and then divide each one by n. That's going to be your weight. That's going to be your filters. Because these are small data sets. Kinetic is actually big. Kinetics data set is big. It's coming from YouTube videos and you have many of them. But then uh, UCF 101 is a small data set. You need to be able to do transfer learning from whatever that we learned from 2D convolutions to 3D. That's why you start with a 2D convolution. That's going to give you a bunch of 2D filters. And then you inflate it in time. You just copy it n times and divide each weight by n. And then one other modification to what we saw earlier is that you have two networks and you train them separately rather than at the same time. You train this one separately, this branch. You train the second branch over time separately. And then in the end, you vote for the prediction at this time. So is everything clear so far? So is it clear how you create inflated 3D convolutional networks. This is good because now it's very easy to initialize them. You initialize them using a 2D convolution. You initialize your weights smartly. And basically, you are doing your transfer learning from two dimensions to three dimensions. OK. 
okay in terms of architecture you're gonna use an inception architecture a video goes in and then the only catch is when you're doing your your uh, 3d convolutions they don't necessarily have to be symmetric this could be a three by three convolution in space but then you can have a one by one convolution in time why is that because you usually have many more pixels than time steps so you need to pace this field of view smartly so after this operation the, your field of view is going to be seven in time and 11 by 11 in space then uh, you pace them smartly there is going to be one by one three 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 and then your max pulling is going to be uh, one pixel in time and three by three windows in the space then your receptive field is going to be 11 in time and 27 by 27 in the space so you paste them out so that in the end you don't blow out in terms of your time dimension and basically looking at a bunch of zero padded uh, frames in your time so you just have to pace it out in time so are these parameters pretty sensitive to the length and frame rate of the video um, that's right, it, for a given length if you have a high frame rate you know what i mean maybe you're not zero padding so much at the end there yes that's correct okay but uh we saw even in the first paper that a video, you're going to break it down into clips and then each clip is probably having 100 or 99 frames in it. Okay. And then in the end, your entire video, you're just going to use these clips to vote. It's a bag of clips. Why is that? Because this is going to become extremely computationally ex uh, expensive. 3D convolutions are not cheap. Even uh, putting a video on a GPU is gonna consume a lot of memory and your batch size is gonna be very small. It's gonna be probably one video or two videos that you can fit on your GPU. So there are some constraints that we have to deal with. Makes sense. And then we are gonna use an inception module. These modules that you see here, INC are your inception module. There's nothing special about them. It's what we covered for 2D. Now you have a third dimension. There is a data set introduced by these guys in another paper. It's much bigger than the benchmarks in your video data set. And it's gonna be action classes, a list of action classes, and they cover person actions. It's a singular, like drawing, drinking, laughing, punching. So these are your labels. It would be person-person actions, like hugging, kissing, shaking, hands, etc. Or it could be a human object interaction like opening a present, mowing lawn, washing the dishes, etc. So these are your labels. There are going to be 400 human action classes in total, and you're going to have 400 or more clips per class. If you multiply these two numbers together, that's how many clips you have in your data set. And in terms of state of the art, we saw some of these papers already. C3D, we saw it, and uh, we saw the two-stream fusion. We saw two-stream and whenever you see i3d that's this method and the best results are coming out of pre-training on the entire kinetics data set there is also a mini mini kinetic data set the best ones are coming out of pre-training and then training on the target data set ucf 101 or hndb 51. i think i'm finishing right on time for those of you who have questions you can stay and ask and the ones who want to leave they can be. I'll be around. Thank you. Yeah.